Hi, my name is Scott Skogerbo, and I'm here today, guest of Jim Tolstrup here at the uh, High Plains Environmental Center. And I was asked to come here because I'm the one who grew most of these fruit trees that are now planted here in this demonstration fruit orchard. And the High Plains Environmental Center wanted to feature the fruit trees that once were so prevalent in Larimer County. During Pioneer's days, there were thousands of acres of, of orchards here. Uh, Loveland specified, uh, Loveland mostly uh, had cherry trees. Yeah. Uh, Fort Collins area, they had lots of, of, of apple orchards. And as a young man growing up in Fort Collins, I would go around the neighborhoods and, and sample all the, the apples. And, and when I grew to be a, a man, I decided I wanted to um, have, have a, an orchard. So I started collecting all the varieties that were around here, going to the CSU library and finding this old Colorado Agriculture and Mechanical, Colorado A&M, had made recommendations for our climate based on the work of the pioneers. And, and so uh, the, uh, one of the most important places that helped me in, in knowing which varieties to start my collection was the USDA Horticulture Station in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And up there they had started planting fruit trees in 1929 and continued on for four decades before they wrote their recommendations. They tested 5,000 different types of fruit varieties from cherries, apples, pears, plums, apple crabs, and all kinds of small fruits, and then made the recommendations. And so those are the ones that I started collecting. And so the I'd like to tell you the story of, many of them have very interesting histories. The first one on the list is called Haas. And Haas was an ap apple that came out of St. Louis, Missouri. And it was planted on the grounds of Gabriel Saray, who was one of the founding members of, the, of St. Louis. And it was named Haas in 1850s and then pioneers brought it west because where did they stop for supplies? St. Louis. And they brought it here and by 1892 uh, a Colorado pioneer by the name of Charles Pennock. We might have heard of him from Pennock Pass up that goes to, to Pingree Park. He built that for $500 according to his grandson told me. But he, his job was an orchardist and a nurseryman. And so in 1892, in the Fort Collins Courier newspaper, they asked him, which varieties do you recommend for, for Larimer County? And at the top of his list for commercial was Haas. And so that's the, uh, that's, I found that it was barely available. It was only found in, in, in extreme apple collectors. I found it in a, one place in a collection in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I added it to my collection. Uh, as the years passed, I, I had no longer lived in that place, and I knocked on the door and I said, hey, I've never tried the Haas, can I try it? went into the backyard, took a bite out of the apple, and I could see why Charles Pennock named that variety. It was crisp, it was juicy, had just enough sweetness to sub-acid balance, and the skin on it was so uh, glossy and beautiful red all the way around, except for a green part on the, on the shady side of the apple. And so I took, asked permission, took cuttings from that, and we've added it to uh, our collection where I work as the propagator at Fort Collins Wholesale Nursery. I've been the propagator there now for 25 years and and so we're trying to bring that apple back. One of the problems that we find is that modern apples have been given great names like 
Honeycrisp and, and Red Delicious and all these uh, wonderful, tempting, mouth-watering names. But the, day, the names of these old pioneer apples were just named after, oh, we found it, the guy who owned Gabriel Soray's estate's name was Haas, so let's name it Haas. And so that was, uh, that's why sometimes if you just see a bunch of apples not ever on a list and it doesn't have a mouth-watering name, it kind of falls by the wayside and eventually gets forgotten about. Um, the, uh, the other list uh, on Charles Pennock, the other apple on Charles Pennock's list was called Wealthy. And Wealthy is um, on, still to this day, even though it was the very first apple released by the University of Minnesota back in, the, in the, about 18, 1880 but uh, Peter Gideon from the University of Minnesota. And, and the wealthy turned out it was some, they were trying to find apples that could survive in Minnesota because it was all the, all these European apples when they'd make it to, you know, the, the really difficult cold climates of Minnesota, they would just die right away just from 30, 40 below, uh, temperatures 70 degrees 70 degrees below zero wind chill and so uh, Peter Guinea uh, Gideon said well if we can cross some some real cold hardy Siberian crab apples with edible apples we can get ones that be survived so he he got some seed from an orchard in Bangor Maine it was called the cherry crab and planted them out and that became wealthy. So from a crab apple, that crab apple had evidently somewhere in, in you know, Maine's a cold place as well, had been pollinated by an unknown apple in the orchard by the bees. And he planted it and it came out to be this beautiful big apple that was cold hardy, it's annual bearing, high yielding, and, and still to this day, in cold hardy places, the wealthy apples still around. And it was on Charles Pennock's list, it was on the top 10 list at the Cheyenne Station, and it's here at the High Plains Environmental Center for people to see and sample someday when these trees are about on the, on the, looks like the fifth or sixth year, and so they should be bearing fruit any year now. Um, the next list is, is I really think that this is an interesting apple. It's called the Good Hue. And it was a top 10 apple at the Cheyenne Station. And it came from Good Hue County, Minnesota from an amateur fruit breeder by the name of T.R. Perkins. And he was just a farmer. But he had, was tied in with the fruit growers of the state of Minnesota. And he went to Professor uh, Harlson from the Harlson apple and said, Dr. Harlson, you should use Melinda as a seed parent because it really has exceptional children. That's what he used the term in, and his children were just young seedlings. And the good hue was one of Perkins's apples and the Cheyenne Station got a hold of it in 1929 and planted it up there. And after those, uh, by 1963, when they wrote their paper, it rose to the top of the 5,000 varieties tested at Cheyenne. It was in the top 10. But it was no longer found anywhere in the country because it was just a farmer who gave a, a plant to the Cheyenne station and it, become, it was lost in obscurity. And so I, when I was trying to get my collection going, I, I went up to the station and I couldn't, most of the trees had been bulldozed after 1962 when the paper was written and just a few uh, were left behind. Gene Howard, the last director of the Cheyenne Station, had tried to, uh, to preserve the 50 best, not just the top 10, but the 50 best because he thought once these trees are gone, there's probably going to be very difficult people to find these varieties. So he, he put ribbons around the 50 best 
and then let the bulldozers come in because it was a USDA station and they, they had already made their recommendations, they had already learned what they wanted to learn and it was expensive to the taxpayers. So unfortunately they bulldozed the 5,000 trees, left 50 behind. I went up there and I found the good hue and it had one branch left that was this long. It was a dead tree, it had one branch that was this long that still had leaves on it. And I knew that if I didn't propagate it and save it, that tree was going to be dead within a year or two. And sure enough, it, that's what happened. I brought it back, propagated it, and man, is that a good apple. Why it was recommended at the Cheyenne Station was because it was the second highest yielder, an annual bear. And every year, there was over 100 pounds of fruit on that one tree, every year except for if a, a late spring frost came by and wiped out the blossom. It just had this annual bearing characteristic, which is sort of rare in apples because they usually take a year off. It's called biennialism. One year they have a fruit. The next year they don't have fruit so that the, en the energy produced by the leaves in the process of photosynthesis can just still build the tree up and it can regain its strength. But the, but the good hue, it, annual bearing, just like the wealthy. And so it's, what I found is that it's one that's perfect for making cider because it's got too much acidity. It's, it's too sour for most people for fresh eating, but for making a cider out of it, it's perfect to blend with the other sweet apples you might have in your orchard just to have a really complex flavor for it. So I think the best use for the good hue would be to make, uh, you know, cider. Um, Gravenstein is one that's my one of my personal favorites. Prior to um, getting my degree in horticulture, I was in the Army and I was stationed at the Presidio San Francisco in California. And in California, in Sonoma County, above San Francisco, is there's a highway called the Gravenstein Highway. And it's because there is where this Danish apple Gravenstein was at its finest. And every year when the Gravensteins came in, the grocery stores are filled with, with Gravenstein. And man, when you have a freshly picked Gravenstein, you want to have it in your yard. It's such a delicious apple. And so first thing I did was I ordered a tree from my mom in Fort Collins, planted it there, and that tree is still there. And that was back in the 80s. And about six years ago or so, I read in the Los Angeles Times, they had talked about how in Sonoma County, California, the orchards of Gravensteins are, are being ripped out, trees cut down, and instead of growing apples, they're growing wine grapes. Because right next to Sonoma County is the famous Napa Valley, and the conditions are so similar that a Sonoma County wine is nearly or just as good as the Napa Valley, and they can, the the orchardists or the vineyardists can make so much more money. And so the, the New York, or excuse me, the Los Angeles Times talked about the last 20 acres of the Gravenstein apple in Sonoma County. So I, I wrote Mr. Walker from the Walker Antique, uh, Walker Apple Orchard, a letter and I said, encloses $35. I would love to, to preserve that apple and and so he took the $35 and sent me the sign and I grabbed it and it's standing right over there. And I don't know if those 20 acres are still there, but once, you know, once Mr. Walker's gone, maybe his family will continue those, those Gravenstein apples, but maybe not. It all depends, but it's still alive here at the High Plains Environmental Center. There's a very interesting apple called the Maiden Blush. And in Fort Collins on East, East Drake Road, there was an old farm there. And the farm was ripped down in the 70s and apartment complexes were, were built up. But where, wherever there was an apple that didn't fall where there was gonna be a parking lot or, a, or an apartment building, they left the apples. And I went 
driving by there one day and I see this apple tree is just loaded with with yellow apples with a with a pink edge on the sunny side wherever the sun ripened that that flesh and man that was such a good apple so I went and propagated it and I I didn't really know what it was and so this is just a educated guess I I think it's maiden blush judging from the trunk of the tree it was this big around and all the apples that were uh, available during that time um, you know a hundred years ago so that's what we think it is and so I, I went back the very next year to get some more signs because I wanted to make more trees and the tree had been cut down so there shows you is that sometimes you think oh I'll just get it next year sometimes you ha don't have that next year sometimes it's it's lost forever just because of the age of the tree and the reason it was cut down is because it was rotten in the middle and it was in danger of maybe falling over and, and falling into some people or falling into a, a near a car in a nearby parking lot but that's why the process of grafting trees makes a tree young again and that's why you can um, have have apples still that have been around for uh, five six hundred years because every generation when someone makes a new one that apple becomes young and it continues to live which leads me to one of the oldest apples that I've that I've I have in my collection it's called the flower of Kent and you'll find it here as well the flower of Kent was Isaac Newton's apple that gave him the idea of the law of gravity. While I was trying to find all my varieties for my collection, I found that the USDA had a collection of apples uh, in their germplasm repository in Geneva, New York. And as I was going down the list, I see the flower of Kent, but in parentheses it said Isaac Newton's apple. Now this was before the internet, so I actually called on the phone. I goes, "What's this story of? Is this the Isaac who gave him the idea of the law of gravity?" They said, "Yep, sure is." Um, I said, "How do you know this?" They said, "Well, we have information from the um, the Royal Horticultural Society in England that that has been confirmed by by uh, tra tradition, and they gave me the reference." I I. I ordered it for inter interlibrary loan and found the story that in 1665, interestingly enough, there was a pandemic where the Black Death was sweeping through Europe. And it was the sixth time that the Black Death had swept through and just like in the COVID pandemic that's happening now in, in, in across the globe, they closed the universities. They sent the students home. They closed the shops. Um, they restricted travel. And young Isaac Newton went home to Woolthorpe Manor in uh, Grantham, England. And it was there that he saw his mother's cooking apple, the flower of Kent, fall. And made him think, why did it fall perpendicular to the earth? There must be some force down in there. And that's where the, he formulated the idea, of, which is now the law of gravity. Now Isaac Newton himself had never, had never wrote that it was the apple that gave, but he told so many people about it, and so others wrote about it. The, the earliest written accord was from the French philosopher Voltaire, who had been, he had been uh, exiled to England 27 years after Newton's death. And that was about the worst thing that a Frenchman could have been done, you know, to, isol to be exiled to England, you know, France's, you know, worst enemy. But it was, it was actually turned out, it was cultural exchange at that, at that moment because Voltaire, an intellectual, uh, didn't know about Shakespeare. He didn't know about the works of Isaac Newton. And so being the inquisitive mind of Voltaire, he asked, what was the apple? And he knew that, that was the flower of Kent. And so in uh, one of his earliest writings, he wrote the, the name of that, of that apple. And so I, I requested science from the USDA 
and 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 here it is at the garden so you can see it as well because of that flower of kent story i've always been interested in history to begin with but it made me want to find more i wanted more trees that could be have a historical story that you, that was a living a tie to history so i started thinking of course being an american johnny appleseed so i said oh i've got to get one of those trees you know i thought surely you know if johnny appleseed planted millions of trees there will be somebody that has a johnny appleseed tree in their collection i just wanted to have the tree and there weren't there weren't any they and i, I quickly learned that the reason why johnny appleseed apple trees weren't around is because they were wild trees which were just seedlings and and then he planted seed off of these wild trees and so some of them were good some of them were bad some of them converted to crab apples some of them were mushy some of them fell off the tree too much and then by the time uh, Ohio and Indiana which is the two states that Johnny Appleseed mostly did his planting become civilized the, the cultivated apple the grafted apples started coming in and they were superior to the apples that Johnny Appleseed planted so they kind of were allowed to get old and die and then civil the towns the villages grew bigger and the, the apples got in the way and they just were discarded but by 1961 I learned that there was one tree still alive and it was in Ashland County Ohio and it was in the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. It says the last tree of Johnny Appleseed. And that was three years after I'd given up my hope. And I had gotten a book from my wife for, for my birthday present. It's called The Book of Apples. And that was, my, that was my hint. One tree still alive in 61. So I found um, a woman who knew about it. She was the... Uh, reference librarian at the Ashland County, Ashland, Ohio Library. And she said, oh, that, that tree unfortunately died in 1965, but the man whose farm it was on is still alive. Uh, let me look up his phone number or give him a call. And I, his name is Roy Funk. I called him up and I said, Mr. Funk, I introduced myself, told him I was looking for it, I, that last tree. And he goes, oh, that tree was real, you know, that was the pride of our farm, you know. Uh, we bought the farm in 1959, and so it was alive for a few years after that, but um, it unfortunately died, but I still have pieces of the wood from it. I said, did anybody ever get cuttings from that tree? He goes, I think they did. And he said, hey, Dorothy, get the scrapbook out. I've written in the scrapbook about who took cuttings. Well, what happened was there was a seventh grader, a seventh grader from... Brunswick, Ohio, and he wrote it in his scrapbook. That was the only one to ask for cuttings. No, no professors from Ohio State, no nurserymen, no interested orchardists, even, even though it was the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Ohio's leading newspaper, a seventh grader asked for cuttings, and he was from Brunswick, Ohio, and that was my second lead. So I called up the school district in Brunswick and called and called, and this is before long distance got to be free it was long distance was expensive and my long distance bill was was uh three hundred dollars i remember god three hundred dollars but i found the teacher who had led that ohio history field trip down to jeromesville in ashland county ohio and she said i don't remember the name of that student but i know where he gave the cuttings to and he was a local orchard by the name of Bill Eisen, and he had a, um, an orchard and an apple pie bakery. They turned his apples into apple pies. So I called that Mr. Eisen's, and he still had the tree in front of his bakery in Brunswick, Ohio. And, and he was kind of a, a stoic man, a man of few words, and so I asked him, is the tree any good? And he said, oh, I suppose. So is it good for fresh eating? He goes, oh, heavens no. 
Is it good for making apple pies? He goes, no, no, it's, no, it's not sweet enough. I said, well, what is it good for? And he goes, well, it's excellent for chucking at cats. But that was what, that was his opinion because he was used to these modern apples, which were bred specifically for various things. But this last tree of Johnny Appleseed was just a seedling. It was the longest lived of all the millions of trees that Johnny Appleseed grew. But that didn't matter to me. I was interested in the, in the, in the history of the apple. And when my trees grew up and I was able to get the tree at my house to give his first crop, it's actually a pretty decent apple. It's, it's red, it's attractive, it's um, sweet, it's crispy, it has some, um, some juiciness to it, but it's bland. So I think that's what I was talking about. It's, it's like a bland, uh, red delicious. But as far as that, I think if you blended that with other apples to make a, a cider, imagine having an apple cider made with the last tree of Johnny Appleseed. So the next apple is an interesting one for Colorado pomology. It's called the Colorado Orange Apple. And it was found by uh, Judd and Addie Schoenmeyer from the Cortez, Colorado. And they have a really interesting program. It's called the Montezuma Orchard Restoration Project. And their idea, it's a nonprofit that they've started, is where they're trying to rescue the old orchards species that were grown here in, in Colorado, specifically in Montezuma County where Cortez is. There at one time were 8,000 apples down apple trees in Cortez and it was a big orchard area back in the days before interstate trucking and so the people who lived in that part of the of the world would get their apples from from the orchards in Cortez and as the years went by interstate trucking came in it was too expensive to make it to the Denver Albuquerque market and so they just uh, was economically unfeasible and the trees just got old and started dying and, and uh, Jude and Addie, they they saw well these need to be rescued because so, there's so many old varieties that that aren't around anymore. So they started going from orchard to orchards and propagating them and planting them. In the meantime, they had uh, these old records, and they had ones that specifically did well in state fairs and were recommended by old. Um, you know, CSU uh, recommendation lists. And, and so they started making wanted posters, not wanted dead or alive, it was wanted alive. And so they'd stack them, put them around the states at, and uh, in grocery stores and in uh, gardening clubs, and they started getting calls. And they said they were looking for this apple called the Colorado Orange. And it was from the 1870s, and it was from Fremont County, Colorado, where Canyon City is. And they got a call, and sure enough, um, it matched the descriptions. There is no DNA sample of it, so they don't know if they uh, for sure have it or not. But because there were wax castings that are in the collection at CSU in the horticulture department that matched it perfectly, there was um, diagonal slices um, in the in the apples, and and uh, watercolors were made in 1905 of the Colorado orange, and it matches perfectly. It's it was uh, said to be a very good tasting apple. It actually made it had some fame where Iowa State University was using this apple in their breeding program because it had orange skin. So a very interesting apple that which apples have orange skin, thus the name the Colorado Orange. So they've found it and I am helping them to build up numbers and so one tree now is here at, in the collection here. Um, one of the most interesting plants that are still alive at the USD Horticulture Station in Cheyenne um, is called the Hung Hai Tung Crab Apple. And it was 
um, planted in, in 1929 there, so the tree now is 91 years old. And many people who visit the, re the remnants of this long abandoned horticulture station in Cheyenne, it's their favorite tree. It's this massive tree that's probably 40 feet tall and it has apples about the size of a um, ping pong ball that are actually pretty decent for a crab apple. Um, but when I went into the records to try to find more about this spectacular apple that has, by the way, has um, two inch diameter flowers. That's where it's, as an ornamental characteristic, that's why this particular tree is, is, is ornamentally desirable. Um, we found that there was a famous explorer by the name of Dorset who'd went to China in 1927 and that was the time when during the, the Chinese Revolution when Chiang Kai-shek was chasing around Mao Tse-sung and who was going to win the Civil War was still touch and go. But here's Dorset going from place to place to place. There's photographs of him riding on a donkey and he would get refuge at night by sleeping in Buddhist temples. And in Jilin province in northern China, he was stopping at a temple by the name of Fa Hua Shu, which means the Temple of Transformational Thoughts. And he learned that um, when, a, when a Buddhist monk would die, they would put his ashes in the field and plant a tree as a living stupa to remember that. And if it was a wealthy monk, they would have a stone stupa, but the poor monks had trees. And so the Hung Hai Tung was a living stupa. And because of the edibility of the fruit and hearing tales of how nice the flowers were, Dorset took cuttings back and ended up at the Cheyenne Station. And so it's a very interesting, unique looking apple that um, when you go out to the, come visit here at the, at the center, you will be instantly be able to tell the difference between the edible apples and the Hung Hai Tung. Another apple that came from the work of um, the list of, of uh, Charles Pennock in Fort Collins in 1892 was called the Udder's Red, and that was another commercial apple. It was another 1850 apple from Wisconsin. And um, it's still uh, not very much history is known of this tree other than what I've just told you, but as a commercial apple and being recommended um, so long ago and still around to this day, it's, it's a decent apple to have in your collection. There is a, an apple that I, I think is one of the most interesting stories to me. It's called the Renown. The Renown apple is still alive at the Cheyenne Station. I said earlier that they grubbed out, bulldozed the 5,000 fruit trees and they left 50. Well, the rest of the story is that in 1974, the station was closed. And, and the station abandoned. So since 1974, so what is that? That's 40, 46 years ago, these trees at the Cheyenne Station haven't been watered until recent history. 46 years surviving a natural precipitation and this apple renown is still alive. Where many of the 50 trees that were left over have died of drought, had died of not being able to, to handle 40 plus years of, of 15 inches of moisture a year. But the renown is still there. So I went into the records to find out more about it. And it was sent in 1936 from the Indian Head Saskatchewan Ag Culture Canada research station up there. And the, the story behind this was that when the Canadians were trying to populate the, the prairie provinces, they had a homestead act just like America did. But into the 1930s, they still had 
homesteads to be had up there because it's such a harsh climate. It's north of North Dakota, north of Montana, all these prairie provinces. And when when families would go up there, it was it was just grasslands and the wind and the cold and the 50 below zero and the plants that they brought with them from eastern Canada or, or elsewhere didn't survive. So Ag Canada says, we need to, to do something about that. So they started breeding plants, testing plants in all these horticulture stations there. And and apples were such an important thing. So they would did the same thing that Peter Gideon did in Minnesota. They crossed hardy crab apples with hardy apples with the hopes of coming up with something that would live. Well, the renown was one of them. And how they came to that, to, to name it renown, was during the 1930s, you remember, the Great Depression was going. It didn't just affect America, it was affected Canada as well. And so in, in, in Indian Head, there was an orphanage, not because the parents had died, but because the parents couldn't care for their children. During while they were looking for work, they had to travel far and wide to find work, so they let the government care for their kids while they got back on their feet. Well, the station directors were tired of chasing the children out of the out of the test orchards so they finally said let's just see which ones they like so they're watching these kids raiding the test blocks with their binoculars and they saw the orphans go from one tree they try a bite it was no good they would throw the apple away and if they if they liked it they'd fill their pockets up and then Finally, they looked over and they saw an orphan who was jumping up and down. Hey, guys, come over here. Come over this one. This was great. So all the orphans went over to this one tree, which was a numbered selection at the time, didn't have a name. And every single or orphan, after they tried their fruit, emptied their pockets up off of all the other apples and filled it up with this one. And so they named it Renown because it was renowned amongst the orchard, uh, the orphans. And so that is I think that this apple, it's an it's a apple uh, crossed with the crab apple. It's about the size of a ping pong ball, which I think is like the perfect lunchbox apple for a child. If you send them with a, an apple, a big old red delicious or something, often they'll just take one or two bites and that's enough. But if they had this sweet, juicy, this apple is exceedingly sweet and crisp. That they'll that two or three bites of it and the apple core it's an apple core it's done. So I think that this one has extreme potential. The other interesting thing is that I started doing more research to find information that in the internet age. I found that in apple test an apple testing in Fairbanks, Alaska, that the renowned apple was hardy for Fairbanks, Alaska. So that you know it's a tough one. <laughs> that concludes the story of, of many of the apples, but not all of them here at the state, at the uh, High Plains Environmental Center. So come here, this is a great place. I, I really enjoy what they've done here with the historical apple and, and fruit collections. They have a lot of native plants. There's community gardens. It's an idyllic set, setting with beautiful views of the mountains. And I really, I'm, we're very, very lucky to have this in our community. So hope you enjoyed my stories. Thank you.